Okay, I'd like to welcome you to the session on block classes, engagement high, dead time low, that's the hope. Uh, there's three of us here, I guess we'll all say a little bit about our experiences and then we'd like to open it up uh, to conversations and questions. Since I'm a moderator, I'll let myself go first and then I'll pass to my colleagues. I like the moderator by default, so I will take advantage of that. I uh, like teaching block classes, graduate and undergraduate. I, I teach both types of classes, but I really enjoy block classes. And the reason I enjoy them is because you can have a sort of a narrative that goes on for a fairly good period of time, and there's a lot of flexibility within that time. You have people's attention, you can connect with them, and then roll with that. I structure my syllabi in such a way that I think it, it makes it more likely you'll have productive time in a, in a block class. And what I do is I have a, uh, a format where every class, once a week, every class is a commentary, a written commentary due. And the commentary is on the reading assignment. Commentary has four parts to it. That's right. it's, it's typed up and it's put up on Blackboard. It's got a takeaway section. What do you take away from the reading? A free write section. What inspired you about this? And just write for a few minutes about it. Uh, a set of questions that uh, you, or one or more questions that you would like pursued by the class. And thirdly, one or more quotations from the reading that you thought was good writing and engaging in some way. Now this means, and I require these to be in 24 hours before the class. So you have to get them, download them, and read them. But they're very interesting, especially when you start interacting around these. Students can read each other's work, of course. And what I do then is, I, have, I read these all so I know pretty much what they're thinking about, and how they've been touched or not touched by the reading, and whether or not it was successful as I see it. Then I always <clears throat> break the class into little groups of two or three where people share their commentaries, what it is they want to share from their commentaries. And that goes on for 10 or 15 minutes. And I do that in part because I want to make sure everyone has a chance to speak. Some students are a little shy and don't want to speak to the larger class. Then within those small groups, <clears throat> I ask people to pick the one point or points that they want to pull from that small group to share with the class. And then they share that with the class, and then the class builds its conversation around those materials. So I can honestly say that when people know that these commentaries are taken seriously, and when you comment on them, people do them very carefully, and they can run the entire class. I have not had a class where I've ever had a single problem with time management because there's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of basis for interaction. Now, if there's a slowdown, I do have certain strategies I'd recommend. And one of those uh, strategies I recommend is to <coughs> develop some hands-on projects. Now, one of the ones that I found very useful is you've had this reading. Let's say I taught a class last year on extreme confinement. And I started with the death camps and I worked all the way down to solitary confinement in America. It's a pretty broad class in the honors department. But a very exciting readings. And I would say, you've had this very difficult, challenging reading. You've talked about it. You've written poems. Many kids write poems about it, uh, the beginnings of poems, at least. And I said, if you were, being, if you were going to do a documentary on this, what would you want to put forward? What is it you'd want to tell other people about what you read, and how do you think you'd do it? People talk in little groups for 10 or 15 minutes about that. And then if you're lucky, you have a little documentary to show and say, all right, now you are sort of resident experts on this topic, and you've thought about how to articulate it in your writing, and maybe even in a documentary. What criticism would you give to this documentarian? If you were a consultant, and I was paying you for your time, what would you tell me that I could have done better or differently, and why? Now, these students are not documentarians. I'm not a documentarian, but it's a good vehicle for a conversation, because we all think visually at times. We all like documentaries. And the topics that I teach tend to lend themselves to that. So I find that to be an extremely uh, valuable exercise. Uh, I think, uh, aside from generating the small group interaction, bleeding into the large group interaction with the hands-on activities, you have to have a, a 10 or 15 minute break in the middle with food. Okay? I always bring a set of healthy snacks to my classes because I don't want to lose students. I don't want them wandering off to get coffee or to get lunch. Because in a conversational class, you have to be there. Right? If, you, if you're not there, we're missing part of that voice. And it's very distracting when people come and go. So I tend to go to Trader Joe's, and I bring in either cookies, or I bring in Kind Bars, K-I-N-D. They're very healthy and very good. I've had no problems with students not liking them, so maybe I'm just been lucky. You know, people can be pretty fussy. I don't force them to eat it. Don't miss me wrong. But I mean, having it there, I think, I really feel, and maybe it's because I'm older, 
But I feel that people feel cared for in that context, and it helps to establish a friendly climate. Uh, my style of teaching, and I taught Rainey many years ago, so she can comment on this, is a very um, collaborative in that in the topics I'm teaching about, I really am always still thinking about them. So I don't really have a pat answer to give anybody, which is helpful, because that means that all those interactions are of great interest to me. Right? I still write about them. I do social science writing, legal writing, creative writing. So any of those things, I encourage the students to do and to engage each other. And I can say that that small group climate uh, really does generate some new thinking for students. It gets them moving in directions that are new for them. Now, the largest class I've taught in a block is 26 students. So if you get past that, I don't know what the management issues are. 26 was a bit of a challenge, to be honest. I like it 15 to 20. That would be the ideal. So if you can get a class that you can manage and divide up into subgroups, I think you could make that time work well. And I, I feel that because people are so distracted by telephones and other activities now, that block can really capture people. Right? What happens is people will sit around eating their kind bars, talking during the break. They won't even leave the room sometimes. So really, that's a great success. And I, you, know, you don't quite know what the explanation is. Uh, I think uh, if people know that they're in for the long haul, they invest themselves in it. You really can't tune out in a two and a half hour class. That's pretty painful to imagine, right? Now, when people, people do sometimes get tired. The room is a little warm here, in my opinion. I'm in, uh, what is it, uh, Hearst 102 in the Honors Program. That's a terrible class. <laughs> in my and really, I often say to people, if you feel a little confined, that's good, because we're talking about prison issues. <laughs> and it's, uh, but it is, a, I would say you'd like a room we could have a circle. That would be much better. But I have to sort of break up into little clusters. So those are my thoughts. And I guess I'll just pass them next to you, Rainey. And then we'll just okay. maybe go around and then open up to, to conversation. OK. A um, little <coughs> context here. Uh, 2015 marks my 24th year being an adjunct uh, here at American University. And I only ever want to teach the 810 to 1040 graveyard God, shift. God bless you. That, that is my shift. I love it. Um, <laughs> but it comes with its own set of challenges because uh, students that typically um, that take the 810 to 1040 blocks, they're coming from work, they're coming from internships, they have not had dinner, uh, having class at that time, whether because it's a requirement or whether it's because you really love the subject matter, is no doubt at least once a month, if not more, going to interfere with a high profile speaker on campus that evening, a party somewhere. I've had the dubious honor of having to teach on many a Halloween and, and Valentine's Day. <laughs> so right off the bat, I know the decks are somewhat stacked against me, which is why I try um, to keep an energetic class, if, if nothing else. Um, in order to do that, I, I guess I've, I've got four pearls of wisdom to share with you in no particular order. I'll just start with the type of discussion. Um, as Rob mentioned, I was his grad student many moons uh, ago, so we teach classes about the prison system and the death penalty. So off the bat, at least we've got interesting, interesting um, subjects to keep people awake at that point in time, but I have found that dividing the classroom discussion up half lecture and half actual discussion sort of changes the dynamic because um, at least with my subject matter, I, I don't want the students to be too far out there free forming on, on their own simply because there are some nuts and bolts uh, uh, to you know, midterm and final exam questions that there are right and wrong answers to. So I generally teach, actually lecture, for about 30 to 40 minutes at the start of the class give them some sort of break. No, I, I'm, I'm not the kind-hearted person that brings in food and, and stuff, but I actually give them, you know, an eight to ten minute break to go do whatever it is they need to do. I haven't lost a little lamb yet, so, uh, you know, they do come back, and if not, you know, it's their money. 
Um, so after the break, I open it up for a con what I like to call a controlled um, class discussion. I will come ready with at least five to ten current queries, um, discussion points about things that are happening in the subject matter now that are off textbook, off reading, something that's going to energize them um, to discuss, debate, have some sort of argument for the remainder of the class time. And it works well um, because it gives them an opportunity to express themselves beyond whatever that week's required reading is actually going to be. Um, when old man weather conflicts with the class, then to me, you kind of have to be ready to jump in and make Blackboard something that is a part of your regular class um, format so that when class does get canceled, as the 810 to 1040 um, block classes tend to get canceled a lot um, during, you know, January, February, and in March, you kind of need to be ready to jump in on Blackboard and continue the discussion. So um, when I think there's going to be a lull in the conversation, I utilize bringing doc short documentaries to class. I will turn the query part of the discussion into a game or, or something, anything that's going to keep them awake, you know, past 10 o'clock that, that night. Um, to sort of make things interesting. Um, I, I've been fairly successful over the years bringing in guest speakers at that time a night as long as I don't keep them uh, past 9.30. So on a night that I've got a guest coming, I'll ask if they can stay from 8.10 to 9.30 and you know, after that it's fine, we can resume with whatever it is we're going to resume with because um, it is awfully late to ask a guest to come uh, right after work and, and such. So where that's appropriate, I will do that. Uh, I take my classes on a field trip once a semester. It's the type of class that is conducive to doing that. Obviously, it's not at 8, 10 at night, so when I do that, I take my students to prison. That's an all-day trip and, and stuff, and we make accommodations, etc. But, you know, again, trying to infuse things that are going to want to make them maintain their interest that late at night. With respect to the assignments, I like to try creative assignments um, for students because yes, you've got to have an exam and given the subject matter, I try to keep the objectivity to a, a written exam. Uh, usually, um, well now I, I seem to be in a in a lull where the class sizes are more manageable. When I first started um, teaching here at AU, my block classes were like 40 and sometimes 50 people at night. That's a lot of students, so I don't do papers <laughs> because that's just extra work uh, on, on uh, me to have to, I'm an adjunct by the way, so I don't, I've got a day job that, uh, you know, needs my full attention uh, at times when I'm sure full-time professors have time to grade papers. So I stopped doing papers when the numbers started uh, making that sort of cost prohibitive um, for me. But that doesn't mean that I can't shepherd the students through all of the dynamics of having to write papers. I've been trying something that I call progressive paper writing for years and the students tend to like it. That is that I take them through every um, facet of having to get ready for a term paper or a thesis, how to shape and craft the thesis statement, how to do a complete and thorough research of bibliography, um, so forth and so on. I, I just break that out into phases where they have to share that work with me for a grade, but they just never end up writing a paper. 
So they have fun doing all of the research and, and really honing their skills on how to come up with a great piece of work product that they just don't ever write. Um, for me. I take them up to the door and they've got all this research so that if they go to another class and there's a good topic, hey, there's a paper to be had here that I've already done the research. I do um, and have started recently breaking them up into smaller groups to do class projects. Um, I did that with my graduate students. Uh, it's amazing the creativity that is walking around here on this campus if you just give them a topic and let them free form in how the information is going to be relayed back to the class uh, and I sort of force them to do class presentations because in the School of Public Affairs or at least this is my humble opinion in the School of Public Affairs um, to me that sort of is indicative you got to have a bunch of public speakers in there so even the most quiet person in the room is going to have to get up and do a presentation that's hopefully not tied to a PowerPoint. Um, what else? Um, say, say two words about that. Why would you got against PowerPoint? I don't have anything against PowerPoints. Um, in fact, uh, for a lot of the assignments, I prefer my students to turn in a PowerPoint instead of writing uh, a long paper of such simply because um, I found that grammar sometimes is not the most um, eloquent thing that comes from um, some of the students and again I just don't want to have to wade through the valley of um, me trying to figure out what it is you're trying to say. So PowerPoints have been very helpful. Um, that time of night I have noticed that when my guest speakers come in and gin up a PowerPoint, the back row starts to wane to fall asleep. So I, I try to keep high energy so that they keep high energy that time of night. I also, and you know, this is just something that I do for my own sense rather than trying to help the student, well, I do try and help the students out. In the fall, I front load my syllabus. In the spring, I put it on a slow simmer. Um, translation in the in the fall, um, September, October, in the first part of November is going to be very heavy so that when term papers and other things for other professors start coming due around Thanksgiving and shortly thereafter, they don't have to worry about me because all of my work has been front loaded. So that's sort of the give and take I, I try to give to them. I do the flip of that in the spring because I try to combat senioritis as, as best as I can. So we start taking the snow months, as I like to refer to them, um, as a little bit slower and I start hitting them after spring break in April to maintain that um, diligence. So I don't know, just a, just a few um, comments and I'll turn it over to Amy. I was appointed the... Uh the organizer when I walked in the door. So I, I really should have introduced people and I have to apologize. Um, I'm from the Department of Justice, Law and Criminology. And I've taught there since 1977. I won't mention when you were in school with us, but <laughs> it was not that long ago. Uh, Rainey got her PhD in our program and then got her JD from Catholic Law School, is now a federal judge. We are very lucky to have her as, as an adjunct teacher every semester. And she also grades comps and is just a wonderful colleague. I should have said all those things oh, in advance. Okay. So we are just thrilled to have you uh, there. Uh, now, Amy, I don't know you, so I can't introduce you, but uh, if I knew I was a moderator, I would have checked well, it. Well, not, not an issue. We just voted you moderator about a minute ago. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, hi, my name is Amy Eisenman. I'm in the School of Communication. I'm the director of a weekend program for adult learners called Interactive Journalism and another one called Media. Um, entrepreneurship, and I also teach undergraduate and graduate classes. Um, I have some great colleagues here who also are wonderful instructors. I spot you guys, and my dean is here actually, so I better be good. Um, let me tell you a little bit. I, I would call this presentation kind of, you know, shake it off. Um, no more sage on the stage, but I look at everything as a guide on the side, um, which is a purely experiential. Uh, way of approaching the classroom. I have about seven or eight points, and I'll just add another PowerPoint. My PowerPoints are mostly just visuals. You know, 
I guess the best question that we all should ask ourselves is, would I want to be in my class? Mm -hmm. And so if you're sitting in the back of the room and you slap up the PowerPoint that you don't even want to read, it's really not fair to make somebody else want to either. So I use a lot of kind of visuals to get people um, involved. Um, let me go through about seven or eight points and then just see where we can open it up from there. I'll admit, can you see me because I'm kind of short? Um, I change the format in a classroom about every 23 minutes. Now, 23 minutes is about the length of a TV sitcom. <laughs> and, um, you know, everybody pretty much is between 20 and 25 minutes is going to fade into another topic. That's <laughs> basically how I feel. Some of my classes that I teach on the weekends are 9 to 5. It's a really long block class. So I have to change the format. Sometimes the format's one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes it's a lecture, sometimes it's a discussion, sometimes it's just working. But about every 23 minutes or so, I'll, you know, 25 minutes, I'll change. The second thing um, is to figure out what all those different formats are that you like in your classroom. What are the best ways that you teach? I, I think everybody should teach to their strength. I think you should teach what you know, learn what you don't, and bring in an expert when you really don't know something. Um, I think that you should figure out which formats, like I'm, I have a colleague, John Watson, who is the most magnificent speaker. He can stand up in front of the room and talk, right, Lena? I, I, I couldn't do it. And, and, he, and, he, and he, he just talks, and, and, and the students are like this, listening to him, um, because he puts his words together so much better than I do. He's playing to his strength, and I think that's what you do. I think what I like to do is uh, kind of walk around the room um, and talk to people. Number three, this is a funny one. How many of you have been to like workshops and seminars and all that kind of stuff? What's one of the best things they do when you pay to go somewhere to hear a session or all day session? Open bar. <laughs> and I do that in all my classes. <laughs> I want to be in your class. <laughs> now, um, that's really very good. And the kind food. Kind bars, yeah. Yeah, the food I put in was pretty sugar heavy. And that's why they all go nuts. But um, I like to put the agenda on the board, mm -hmm. particularly in a block class. So it will be down to the minute. It will be mm -hmm. nine, you do this too far. Do 9 to 9.15 this, 9.15 to 9.45 that, because they're invested in it. And it's their guests, they're, they're paying customers in your classroom. And they should be invested, when can I go to the bathroom? When can I get a break? When do I have to listen? Is this going to be important? And so they're all part of it. Now, and also, it helps me. I, I'm probably not as good as you guys at rolling from one subject to another without looking at my notes. Um, but it helps me pace myself as I go through the, through the room. Number four, um, and this one might be a little rainy, we're talking about classes have changed mm -hmm. over the years. The students have more going on than ever before, internships and jobs. So if you're in a block class, you really, I would suggest that you consider the opportunity to give them time to do work in class, mm -hmm. particularly project work. They can find ways to communicate with each other, go on Facebook, go on cover. Oh, hi, Margo. It's not a great instructor. Um, they have a lot of ways to reach each other, but the truth is, they can't. You know, you take somebody who, who's supposed to be the boss of the group, and, and, and they're trying, but they are so busy. They really, and if they have to commute in the city, which is getting worse than ever before, mm -hmm. if they have to commute here from an internship or a job, it's just not going to happen. So I actually give them time in class. Now, of course, in a communication class, in a journalism class, this is critical because we have to give them time when they can go out and do interviewing and video videography. But I also put this on my syllabus so that they know right now, just now, I was working on my syllabus. February 13th is a reporting day, and March 3rd is a reporting day. They know that that's when they have to set up appointments. And underneath it, I write, giving you this time so I don't have to hear from you later that you couldn't reach somebody because you can't give me that excuse. I'm giving the time to reach somebody. Um, number five on my list, I have a lot of group reading during these block classes. Um, the reason I do that is then they're having the experience at the same time. So everybody takes the 20 minutes. If you're doing a case study, maybe, you know, Columbia University uses a lot of their case studies. If you're reading a case study, they're all reading and experiencing it at the same time. You can kind of gauge the fast ones versus the slow ones. And you can figure out, and then some of them can go on and get their emails and watch while they're waiting. 
But then you like, all had this experience freshly at the same time, and you could discuss it in a really, a really powerful way. I'm not saying you want to give up your time all the time to do that. You're supposed to do the readings outside of class. But this is something that may have just come up. I also think that um, along the same lines, when you have speakers, it's um, if you have an opportunity, if some of your speakers are fairly high profile, it's pretty good to show them up on the screen. And then the speaker walks in, and it's like, whoa, that's an important person. And I better listen. And there's something about that visual um, background or on the speakers that you're bringing in or, 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 or <coughs> giving them the knowledge of the person. And they come in and they sit up and think, wow, I just saw that person quote on TV. <laughs> um, number six, oh, for, for guests, and Randy was talking about guests, I'm a complete, you know, I mean, particularly in the digital journalism field, our, our business is changing like a minute ago, it just changed, and another minute ago, it just changed again. <laughs> it's so fast that we have to bring in guest speakers. But you can bring in guest speakers who tell you war stories, and you can bring in guest speakers who are whatever. I, I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way, but make sure you have some young guest speakers in there. Now, some of the vets are fantastic for telling the stories, but they love the young speakers. They love the people two or three years out of school because they're there, they're proud of themselves, they just learned you know, how to you know, go out and work in the world. They made it, they did it, and they're in their first jobs. Now, obviously, and again, I, this is probably going to come back and haunt me somewhere on some tape, but um, I, I, you know, I bring in a range of speakers of all ages, but just make sure that you have some younger ones among the people that you bring in. Um, the other thing I do with my guest speakers is I um, set them up. I set them up for what they're going to be talking about, and I send all my guest speakers a breakdown of who's in the class, not by name. I've got this one that works here. I've got this one that wants to be this kind of journalist. I've got this one who works at the U.S. Council for Bishops. I've got this one here. Because the speakers need to have, like all of us, need to know who's in the room and how can I best present to them. And then when the speakers are done, I, um, I go over the points of what I think are the high points that the speaker talked about. I'm seriously taking notes the whole time. Along those lines, a colleague of mine, Steve, I think it was Steve Piacente, maybe it was Steve who did this, um, he would have students capture, different student each week capture what was happening in the classroom and put it on the class blog mm -hmm. so that somebody was responsible for capturing what happened in the classroom that day and writing it up. Um, but I always have the speakers super prepared. And I mentioned this at other NPR conferences, so if you were in anything that I talked about this particular topic, I apologize for repeating it. But when you have speakers through technology, remember to close the door when they leave. On Skype, on Blackboard, on Facebook, I have had an experience where I had a speaker come in to my digital classroom, do a talk with us, and then, um, this was during an online class, and then I forgot to lock them out. Mm. And then the students went on and did what? Yeah. He talked about his book. Why is this book for free? He wants everything to be free. Why is this book for free? He was like the Colorado, here's one. Like, oh, no. So I, had a, I, I learned my lesson that even your digital speakers have to be turned off and ushered out of the, the room. <laughs> um, finally, I guess what I like to do, and again, this is probably not as relevant to all classes, but maybe it is in some way, is it's a very experiential model. And I, I just want to show you a project that we do every spring. It's called, um, we have a class called Writing and Editing for Convergent Media. And what we do in that class is um, we do a multimedia project for Oh, this is another thing. What I'm doing right now is breaking all my rules. Never stand in front of a room and scroll up and down a screen. <laughs> and in fact, I make all the students pull up the screen on their own site. And I really mean this, because what's worse than me doing this right now, right? It's really fun, isn't it? <laughs> so you have to kind of look at your own screen to see what's going on. But anyway, this is, um, I don't know if I have the who's here. The links are working Don't out well. Don't do this at home either, right? Yeah, no, you, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm breaking all my rules. Thank you very much for pointing out. Anyway, this is an experiential project where all the students spend the entire semester on this topic. 
We pick a topic at the beginning of the semester, we partner with a media partner in town. This one happened to be with WAMU. And then I send out to the classroom all this list of jobs that they can have on this project. Now the jobs in your classes, I mean being judged would be like a really cool job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what my experience is, I'm really bossy and I can tell everybody what to do. Um, but here, these are just digital jobs and journalism jobs and I'm happy to pass it around. It's probably not relevant to most of you, but it's something that you can look at. And then they fill in their jobs, they fill in their first and second and third choices, and then we come in and we spend the semester transforming the classroom into a newsroom, where everybody's doing the jobs that they want to do. And so I actually wrote this up for, I, I, again, it might not be relevant, but this is a write-up that I had to do for a site about how we did that. So I guess to sum up, oh, one other thing, in terms of how the students in the block classes in particular communicate with each other, they know how to communicate with each other. They are using what, what have they used, you know, that's more contemporary than we even thought lately? Oh, I mean, yeah. Everything from Reddit to yeah. Tumblr to... Vines. I just learned about online. Vines. They're using Vines. But they're communicating. So in this class where these students are building this experiential project, they're building their own Google Docs, they're building their own websites. I mean, again, this is not relevant to some of you, and, and I'd like to hear how you guys do what you do. Um, uh, but know that they know how to do it. Go where they are. That's really the bottom line of it. Go where they are. So that's kind of my formal part of the presentation. And I'd love to hear what some people in the audience think that they can do. Okay. We'll open it up for questions. Any questions or comments or anything you'd like us to try to talk about? I will ask the question. I, uh, I'm Betsy Cohen, the uh, School of International Service. And I am passionate about teaching, and I'm terrible at law classes. Mm. That's my confession. And so I would like to hear more about changing up the format every 23 minutes. Yeah, that sounds good. Can you put it up on the, can we get rid of the screen? Can you put it up on, like, what would a typical class look like? In a block class? Yeah, typical block. So do you, point uh, block, do you think, is, is the strategy, is it better, for example, to have them uh, discuss the topic first before you lecture on a piece of the reading? I, I would tell you to have confidence in your own self in terms of how you want to deliver that information in terms of order. But what I might write on the board is, um, professor returns papers from last week and, and talks about the grades. I'll do that for 15 minutes. Then I'll write um, chapter review and discussions. You better have read case study number 44 um, for this discussion. Then it'll say class works on group project. And then it might be individual meetings with the professor, and it might be speaker comes in, and I put exactly the points of time mm -hmm. that the speaker has to come in and when they have to leave. Only uh, because you guys know you're here for an hour, right? If we suddenly sprung an hour and 20 minutes on you, it wouldn't work. If you have to fill the time that you're given in a kind way to your students. You have right. to invest them in what you're doing. But that's just how I do it. Bridget, I don't know. I'd love to hear from others yeah. how they break yeah. up. How they the break up formats, formats, yeah? Yeah, I always do an internet outline where it's you know, by a point um, so that they can see exact, this exact amount of time. And then it also mm -hmm. helps me to stay on point because I don't want to suddenly go over on their expectation and that the discussion about mm -hmm. semiotics is only going to be 30 minutes. Yeah. 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 Even yeah. if you think it could go on longer. Well, you know, when it, when it goes, when it, if it's like a really lively discussion and it's going on longer, then, then the, the students don't mind. And you don't have that, that expectation is broken, right? And then you can, you know, if it's free time, you can say, we're going to take break and then we're going to regroup. And then you spend mm -hmm. that 15 minutes during break rewriting your outline. So I'll like rewrite the timing mm -hmm. based upon if I want to carry over a particular section. So again, I'm reestablishing expectations. Mm -hmm. And you can also tell them to take that conversation to like your honor class. Yeah, you can always turn up to continue. Okay. Maybe people stand up when they're speaking because it's hard to hear, or at least it is for me anyway. Uh, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, um, I taught in that office. I was with the 8, 10, 10, 30, <laughs> yeah. 11 kids. And I remember one of the kids was like, Hey, Mr. Redline, back home. Um, and it was an advertising class, but I still think you can do this. Um, I had every week I call them flash assignments, and they could happen at any time. And I would actually put them into my PowerPoint and have like lightning bolts or like a rest of all my gifts or something. <laughs> and they would do stuff from make an ad for
for American University to be put on um, Monday Night Football and just observe one commercial break of ads and kind of analyze them. Right. It could ha but it could happen at any time. And they, did, they knew it could happen at any time and always kept them on their toes. So it's a little like, departure from, the, we also had a kind of outline of what was going to happen. And I teach in the weekend class and I definitely have an agenda that they follow. But for this particular class, because I was terrified of falling asleep and not showing, um, I always kept them on their toes during that. And if you can think of any kind of assignment, any class that would be kind of a flash assignment mm -hmm. from Okay, we're in social class. Let's talk about the sociologist right now. Um, or anything like that. How, how much time? 10, 15 minutes? It really depended on the kind of like, for when, when they made, they made Vine videos actually for the, the American University ad. It was their first class and their first flash assignment. I let them have about a half an hour. I did a flash assignment later in the class where they had to make ads for a colleague's uh, film festival. And I fully intended for it to be 20 minutes. And because I made it a contest where they got a prize, they decided to take the rest of the class. And the rest of the class, as you know, is until 10.30, 10.40. So I was like, you know what, if they're having fun mm. learning Final Cut Pro without asking me any questions, I'll just let them go with it because they're making an ad at the end. So Sounds yeah, great. I'm flexible as well. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that, to me, the part of the break it up is format. They could be writing, they could be talking, they could be reading. They could show a video, a short video, 10, 15 minute video. Um, we can get up to move just to form some of the little groups. It's just so that you're not, I mean, I, I, I know I, if I'm just sitting in one place, it's, it's a physical thing, right? It affects your body. You just start slumping and mm -hmm. can't, just can't keep your attention. So it's really different kinds of input. Mm -hmm. Visual, auditory, get up and move around. Mm -hmm. You can't sit there. I know. Yeah. Uh, yes. <coughs> Could I ask a question? I'll make a comment. I use polleverywhere.com. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever used it, the students just poll type poll. in the text. Mm -hmm. number, oh, yes. And you can see, yeah, if you fun. ask a question, mm -hmm. um, really and fun. it moves up and down. Yeah. As the students are, you know, if you ask a question, do you agree with the death penalty? And you mm -hmm. ask at the beginning of the semester, and you can see the polls moving up and down, and you text in on the. But you need a big enough class to. You have do. Critical right. you sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, but my question is, is, is to Rainy, you mentioned about class projects and you said you don't tie them to PowerPoints and so forth. What are your expectations for these class projects when you say you want everybody to speak? I just, what you talk um, about? Um, last semester with my graduate students, I gave them the topic. Okay. Uh, I gave them uh, the topic and the topic was broad enough that they could do um, pretty much anything with it. I broke them into groups of two to three students. I had a couple that wanted to remain on their own because of the topics that they chose, which I, I allowed that. And I just, I just told them the world was their oyster in terms of the format. I had students give me back um, poetry I had students that um, developed, uh, you know, ten-minute documentaries, complete with voiceovers and and the appropriate music. I mean, way beyond my technical um, <laughs> expertise and stuff. I, I was amazed. I, I had um, a couple of students who, um, incarceration. Uh, had touched their families in a most unique and personal way, so they actually did family um, first person historical mm -hmm. sort of interviews mm -hmm. with um, the, the folks, complete with um, using the PowerPoint to put up family photos and, and things of that nature. Um, so, really, I just I trusted them enough to realize that if I gave them the substantive part of what they needed to know, that they could take that and <coughs> run with it with the appropriate level of creativity, et cetera, and the incentive of knowing that it was 40% of their grade, to do something that was a little bit more dynamic than just the standard PowerPoint. And I was blown away by what some of them came up with. Uh, yes, Nina? 
So I actually have a question. I hope there's somebody in the room that um, can help that speaks about like art history or the history because I'm teaching history of photo again for the third third time, and it's two and a half hours of lights off and slides, right? And I and I do break it up by other by some of these things, and so the things that you've suggested have been really helpful. But there's so much information. It's only a semester. It really should be a year-long course. Mm. How, um, how, or what are some ideas that you all, anybody in the room, uh, would have for me? I know that they need to get this information, but I also know that it's two and a half hours with the lights off. Well, well how hours. much can you give before the class? Like the reason I say that is because maybe you could have it. So they come in, they've made notes, for example, and then maybe you ask them to react to one or two of the. Uh, photos that are particularly evocative and then discuss why that's the case. As long as they've gone over the body of work beforehand, then they could sort of dig into parts of it in a way that would not, because you know, I used to do what I call free, I still do free writes, but I do them more now beforehand, I used to do them in class. And this very, can be very freeing. You know, people will react to this and they'll run with it and you'll be surprised at what people see. <clears throat> Paula Lawrence has taught multiple art history classes, and she uses very, very different, you know, she's used diaries, mm. she's used, um, you know, the issue of um, expropriation of art and have people do different projects. So she's got variety. She's taught sort of also for extended learning programs, so she's taught different kinds of audiences. So I would contact her, because I borrowed from her as a non-art non historian. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Could you ask students to consider taking the art and connecting it to their major or to a topic? Well, so well, one okay. of the things, because diversity is key in everything that I do, is because I know I'm taking a Western <coughs> history that their midterm paper is a research paper on another mm. topic. So it's either feminist or uh, queer photography or African American photography or Asian photography, and then they have to work in pairs <coughs> to create a video that uh, for the final project. So everybody will be an expert on, on two histories, one what they choose, mm -hmm. and then one that I'm telling them, and then they'll, they're quizzed on um, the other histories. So they have to yeah, watch it. That sounds exciting. I love that idea of, uh, I, first of all, Lena's a spectacular instructor, so I mean, whatever she's doing, it must be working. FYI. But, um, <laughs> but I love the idea of making students experts in something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I do that also in this class. Uh, and I, um, it gives them a little bit of a personality and a responsibility. So you're the research chief, or you're the, um, you, mm. you've become the expert in the legalities of feeding the hungry, or you become the expert on this. And, and it helps them sit up a little bit more and say, I own this. Absolutely. And so I think that's a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. And I think that's transferable to a lot of different classrooms. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to make a suggestion. I've taught uh, block classes a couple of different times to use your librarians. I found that the media librarians and my subject librarian, uh, I found them both to be very helpful. If I know that I'm you know, doing a section on, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to think, uh, whatever it might be, and you know, they have such, they know so much about documentaries or um, you know, fiction or you know, new books that have come out, something that, you know, that can engage the students in a way that I may not have thought of. Mm -hmm. that I, and I found that to be just, you know, their knowledge to be very uh, complimentary. So just a suggestion. That sounds very, very useful, thank you. You had a comment now? I was just going to ask a question to the group because we were talking about, is that okay? Sure. Sure. So last year, a guy named Clay Shirky, who's one of the uh, most um, advanced thinkers in the digital media world, um, wrote on his blog that he was going to ask for lids down in the classroom and all the devices are off. And um, thank goodness we have Dr. Barron, who's <laughs> she's an expert on how we absorb content in digital text. And that made me sit up because I've always had everything on and, and flashing and talking and beeping and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, then the Washington Post, I think this weekend, picked up on a professor mm -hmm. writing a story about they did the same thing, and it started a conversation with our mm -hmm. own um, in our own division in our own school about whether this is a good policy, particularly in a block class. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably we could take up just a few minutes to sure. see where you sure. guys fall on this. Um, mm -hmm. I know I did send out my students as journalists to report on this topic on a Saturday afternoon, and I was surprised to find out how many students said they prefer it closed because of 
distractions to themselves. Yeah. And, and really, we have the expert here on this, so I'm going to call I want to hear what you guys have to say. Well, I, I'm very clear on this. No laptops. Yeah. And it's student-driven. I mean, the students have right. said to me that they sit behind somebody who's on mm. Facebook or whatever, and it's distracting. And so I tell them that, that this yeah. is really comes from them. How about cell phones? And I don't allow cell phones people either. Sometimes and I, it says that if, you ta if I see you using your cell phone or, or device during class, you get a zero for participation that day. Wow. Well, that sounds pretty so, good. Um, and so now what they do is they leave the classroom with their phones. I, you know, I can see it. There's some students who are so addicted they can't spend 75 minutes wow. um, without. What do you do for it? Well, I would be the opposite. Um, actual participation is included if they tweet my class. So I have a hashtag for my yeah. class. And yeah. what it has done in my class is that um, I was always the extrovert in the classroom. I would talk about any topic, whatever, it didn't bother me. I'm finding that when my students aren't as extroverted as me, and it's very difficult to get conversation, but when I go to check the class hashtag, which I'll do during class, or I'll have them, I'll see students starting to comment. Mm. I also understand that laptops are also an accommodation for some students, and they yeah. see jokes on laptops. So it's not fair for mm. those students to feel singled out, and to let, mm. you know, maybe other students don't have the accommodation, but that's how they prefer to take their notes. Also helps me when I'm talking about issues, or current events, or anything that I don't have the answer for, I will actually send mm. a student hey, Lily, can you go look that up about comic books? And she's like, I don't even need to think about it. I already know the answer. Like, those kind of conversations and discussions happen. So that's we almost have, like, that's a great. I was never a journalist. It was like, are you there in my mind? But that's only from watching the music. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's that smart. Can I just say, just to, I do say on the syllabus that you, only by special arrangement with the professor. If you find that it's an important learning tool, is what right. I say. Because I agree with you, it's not. It's important not to out students who need it as an account. That's a good point. So what's the what's the view from the expert? Um, all right, that's a view of the experience. <laughs> there are a wide variety of kinds of courses that we teach, and in some kinds of courses, it matters a lot that you be able to access external information as part of what you're learning in that. Uh, the point about shy students having some way to have their voices heard is extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the more, these days, primitive tools was clickers to be able to have votes. Now, instead of having to buy a set of clickers, you do it on your phone. Okay, but if you have your phone out, you can do other things on mm -hmm. your phone. When you ask a lot of students, particularly in larger classes, how distracting it is if, in principle, the computer is only supposed to be used for note taking, but in practice, overwhelmingly is used for other purposes. You will hear a hue and cry from students mm. about the distraction to my learning yeah. by having to see through your screen in order to see mm. the professor or, or, or fellow students. Um, I was doing a guest lecture in the class for Professor Joe Klein. And I walked into the classroom. This was her Gen Ed course on global digital citizenship. And you felt as if you were walking to the Apple store. <laughs> you know, no, apples are all out. So I asked a number of questions. And I had a divided people into groups to get this question like that. And for one group, I said, if you were teaching today, and these were students who had laptops out, would you let your students use laptops? And everyone in that group said, of course not. <laughs> and I said, oh, but why? <clears throat> well, I can't pay attention because I'm going to be distracted. You know, the students are going to be doing other things. And I am talking to, uh, you know, to, to the wall, namely the screen that's up facing. <clears throat> we all have our different <clears throat> teaching styles. We all have our own purposes. We all know our own class mm. dynamics. So there are clearly people for whom uh, it doesn't make any difference what kind of technologies there are. Who have a teaching philosophy that says, if the students I want to attend, that's their business. If I don't have an attendance policy, and they want to be zoned out, I ask them to please sit in the back of the room. <laughs> so I have a number of colleagues who say, I'm not telling you what to do, but if you're doing stuff with technology, just go to the back of the room so you don't distract other people. Yeah. And that can work. In a smaller class, it can be extremely distracting. Yeah. So you're sitting around the seminar table, Mm. And there's the students, you know, they're really good. 
And then everything can be made available. Um, because it, I, I know exactly what you're talking about at conferences. You go to enough meetings at this university and you do not see the eyes of senior administrators. <laughs> They're all in the black and white and trouble some people. Yeah. Um, and the vast majority of people are not journalists having to learn how to process those two streams. Yeah. They're people believing they can process the two streams right. without yeah. knowing how to do it. That's right. and, and Betsy's right, she's about to say the research shows. They don't. How much did you learn? You, you, you do tests of how much you learned. And it's really clear mm -hmm. that most of the, the, the technologies where you're saying, go do this at the same time you're listening, end up being interesting. Well, Isn't it true that the ones who say that they're confident they're learning the most were the ones learning the least? I think one study looked at this okay, people's projections. Okay, work on multitasking. Which would be in the yeah, multitasking, right, yeah. which is fascinating to me. Uh, true. I wanted to just follow yes. up on what you were saying to take this to an entirely different topic, which is all of you are talking about communications courses and co um, um, fields that use yeah. communications intensively. I was teaching a social theory about the seminar yeah night, um, which is a block class. Yeah. And um, I have to say, the challenge there is to work against the dominant trends that you find. Yeah. You know, like to sort of teach them critical thinking, where you're not just mm -hmm. say, mm. on page one, he says this, but then by, you know, by here, Marx has turned to that. But then you have to remember, last week, we mm -hmm. read about Marx talking with early Marx. He was saying, listen, next week, we'll, you know, you're really trying to build a narr narrative across weeks, maybe right. over within a block class. Yeah that it seems a lot of these strategies are actually um, not very vain. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I would say about that? <clears throat> teach to your strength. I would just close them at that point. You know, or, yeah, we all have key experiences. Years ago, I worked with a student who won a university award for scholarship, and she would G-chat me during her classes. And when I discovered this, I thought, well, I'm letting nobody have a computer again. Once I realized this, this was a student who was an ex excellent student, the best I'd ever taught. And if she was taking the, she was in classes, not yours, and she would, and I, I discovered this. I, re, I pieced it together at one point, and I thought, well, that's it for me. And that's when I stopped using computers because I thought if she is g-chatting people, she was a, a superb student, then everybody's being distracted. So. <clears throat> yes, maybe a final point. I think, I think the comment last. is well taken about you know, some people are taking the communication classroom and some are not. How about I tell you that my block class was internship. So I'm sending 60 students downtown. And one of my assignments was, it's all right for your boss to text or look at their email. But you know, is it professional for you to do that? Mm -hmm. So my assignment was actually for the block class from 9 to 5. You've got to go out at lunch and check your email or text. You've got to go out after 5 o'clock, check your email and text. And then what I did is I sent two emails every hour. Uh, through Blackboard, and you'd be astonished how many people responded to me. So then I gave them zero on the assignment, and I basically said, you know, just so you know how often you're checking it. Yeah. 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 It was a trap. Yeah. 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 Talk to the lawyer here. Be careful. be careful, because, you know, it's great to do this in the classroom, to tweet, and I yeah. love tweeting. Tweet in the classroom, to use um, mm -hmm. poll everywhere, to use interactive, but to actually do that in the workplace, because we're so used to doing it so many others, it may not be appropriate. Oh. Well, very enjoyable talking with you. We've had a lot of yes. interesting ideas. Uh, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you.